Welcome back everyone. I expect in this video, we're gonna have a lot of first time viewers here to the channel. So for those of you guys who don't know who I am, my name's Mike, I run the Mr. Guns and Gear channel, obviously. Um, I am an Air Force and Army veteran. Um, I've made my living with a gun in one way or another, trying to stop bad people uh, for literally over 20 years now. So um, I have experience in a lot of things. I have never been a sniper, just to be clear, just to kind of set some background expectations. Um, I've established untold numbers of observation posts, listening posts. I have done lots of observation overwatch missions. Um, I have done this type of thing that we're talking about here. I've done personal security details uh, for high ranking individuals in the military. Um, I was never a secret service agent, but I know a thing or two about operations like this. I am not the world's most expert. However, with that said, everything I'm gonna to explain to you today about what I think happened uh, with the assassination attempt could most likely be explained to you by someone who's an experienced airsofter or someone who plays Call of Duty. Most of this stuff is pretty basic, guys. There's nothing advanced at all about what we're gonna share today. Um, so let's uh, set the scenario, I think, for what happened just by taking a look at the map of uh, the area where everything was placed. We're kind of rolling that in here on your screen. And then I think there's a video that was released by the BBC. A lot of the videos I'm gonna reference in today's video here, if I don't roll them in in full due to time, they're on my Twitter page. So go ahead and check that out. They're all up there for reference as original source documents. Um, so with all that said, let's take a look here at a BBC video that really showed uh, a good perspective of how everything is laid out right after um, the event was over. You can still see the shooter's body and where a lot of things are positioned in that video. So I'm gonna go ahead and play it and just kind of walk through what we see here. Um, let me fast forward this, it's a little bit quicker. So there you see the police car outside the building. That dot on the top is the shooter, uh, his dead body. They pulled his pants down, which I think is funny. You can see the blood streak on the way down. Now notice the angle of that building. That will become important here in just a second angle of the roof. Also notice the ladder there to the right. We will get to that in a minute. Um, whether that ladder was present beforehand, whether the killer or shooter, I should say, uh, put it there beforehand, we don't know. Uh, we do have some clues though, based on media reporting. Now note this tree right here, this tree is very important. Uh, more likely than not, that blocked one of the counter sniper teams, which was set up on the first building there on the top of your screen. There were other counter sniper teams. Uh, there was two that we originally saw in the videos. And then of course there's the stage where Trump was. Um, but there was two counter sniper teams that we all kind of saw in the initial footage. What I've learned since is that there very likely was a third uh, counter sniper team at minimum. Uh, there could have been more. There's a lot of things we don't know at this point in the video, but there you go, you can kind of zoom out and get a good bird's eye view of what that area looks like. So that's important to understand spatially as we get into this. Ironically, I don't know if you guys can hear it or not, but there is a helicopter flying over me. I did not plan that. Um, but anyway, so getting into some of the details, uh, the shooter reportedly lived an hour away, 20 year old, graduated from a recent high school. As you guys have seen, if you follow me on social media, was in a Black Rock video, which is interesting. Um, the area where the shooting took place was a manufacturing facility where the roof was that he was on. Um, likely, if I had to guess, uh, unsecured in the weeks leading up to the event. So what I'm thinking there on that is that I don't know this person's level of intelligence, ta tactical acumen, whatever, um, but if you lived an hour away, this event was announced weeks in advance at minimum. Uh, he had the ability to go there and recon the site and see what would be a good location, what would be a bad location uh, to get a shot on the president, which of course he did eventually do. Um, if you note uh, the angle of the roof, I'm gonna play a video here. Uh, you can see there are people in the crowd pointing out that he is on the roof, that he has a rifle. He was doing his job, I wouldn't even be doing this. I get some beautiful police support. Look, they're all pointing. Yeah, someone's on top of the roof, look. There he is right there. Right there, see him? He's laying down, see him? Yeah, he's laying down. What's happening? And the we're going to make America better Yeah, look, there he is. Because we have millions and millions of people in our country that should be here. Dangerous people. Criminals. We have yeah, criminals, we have, we have people that right should not be here, right on the roof. it's much tougher than now. it happens to be. Right on the roof. Right on the roof. Right on the roof. 
Toby's turning this way. Be careful, guys. This was started, I believe, 50 seconds before the actual shots were fired. They were calling out to law enforcement, notifying that he was on the roof. Now, one thing that I played that earlier video from the BBC to kind of show you guys is that where the two main counter sniper teams were positioned uh, behind President Trump, uh, the one, we'll call him counter sniper team one for the purposes of this video. I don't think even when the shooter was at the crest of the roof, I don't think that team could have seen him. Um, I don't think they were actually focused on that area, which we'll talk about here in just a second as well at the time. And um, the shooter uh, sniper team number two behind Trump very likely could have seen him as soon as he got up uh, beyond defilade. So our, our cover, I guess, for an easier way to explain it to not use jargon. Um, so basically the, the angle of that roof there that he was crawling up, the Secret Service team was at a very similar level in terms of height. Uh, there were higher ground uh, areas that they could have set up around that area for whatever reason it doesn't appear that they did uh, the most obvious is the water tower that uh, water tower if they had a sniper up there which we'll talk about here in a second uh, very likely this situation would have been avoided altogether but they didn't uh, who made that call i don't know uh, that said getting back to what i was talking about those two main counter sniper teams uh, the main one counter sniper team number one very likely couldn't see him because of the tree even when he got to the shooting position and started engaging um, and then counter sniper team number two probably could see him if you actually see the video of them they start adjusting the rifles right as the shooting takes place so i'm not sure if that was their sector or not and you know that's a little bit old that chart that chart's a couple of months old and if you uh, want to really see something that said take a look what happened Speaking of sectors, let's back up a little bit and kind of walk through that here on Google Maps. I'm going to roll this in on your screen so you guys can see it. Um, but let's talk about establishing security from an uh, Overwatch position type of perspective. So um, for any type of um, dominating terrain or different, different units in the military, call it different things. But if you're trying to secure an area, obviously you're going to identify high points. Uh, around the area where there is a line of sight to the president, right? Or to anyone you're trying to predict, protect rather. And I've heard a lot of people say that the AGR building where the actual guy was on the roof shooting from was the most obvious one. I honestly don't think that's true. I think there's a couple other buildings that are just as obvious and I don't know if they were covered by uh, Secret Service counter sniper teams or not. We don't have that information at this point, but the Main Street building um, that I'm pointing to here on your screen, also a very obvious position for a sniper to establish themselves, as well as right up where it says Fairground Road, those two buildings right there, also very obvious ones. However, there is no doubt that that AGR International building is one of the buildings that would and should have had a lot of attention on it, should have been cleared ahead of time, and may have been. We'll get to that here in just a second. But basically, when I'm going to back out. I don't know why this helicopter is just hanging out over me. Anyway, so if we back out a little bit and kind of understand where these sniper teams were. So sniper team one, obviously we have them at that location. Sniper team two, their areas of responsibility in terms of what they're scanning and what they're looking at, their sectors of fire, if you will, that they're responsible for are going to be divided up ahead of time. Uh, I would imagine if they're professionals and I assume they are. Um, so their sectors of fire should be divided up at least in this area. Uh, basically everything forward of the stage because behind it is that residential area those trees are probably going to obstruct their view in most cases so basically everywhere from uh, where it says Meriden Road, Breckles Farms, Greenhouse, etc., all the way out to where that Honda North is. Those are the areas that should have been covered uh, in terms of a sector sketch and a sector sketch is just so everyone it, once you establish dominant positions on an observation post or or whatever, um, basically you have a sector sketch that everyone who's on different positions understands literally this building is your responsibility, this building is your responsibility, this building is your responsibility, this dead space here, dead space is, is area that you identify that you can't get a proper line of sight, i.e. you can't shoot into. So if there's dead space, in this case, like behind a building, that area of responsibility is delegated to whomever. It's just... That, that, that's how it works, right? If you're trying to establish these sectors of fire to create an area that you are dominating uh, with gunfire, um, or potential gunfire in this case. So 
Um, basically, what we see in the video is that both counter sniper teams behind President Trump are oriented towards this AGR building uh, in the minutes leading up to the shooting, which is interesting. So uh, I would imagine that counter sniper two, that group there, those two dudes, probably had a different sector assigned to them. And very likely over the radio, something happened and they oriented themselves in that direction as well. So to have two counter sniper teams oriented on the same uh, direction at the same time is unusual. I will say that. And if you actually look at the video, a lot of people have, and myself included, questioned why at the time, let me get back to my notes here so I, so I don't mess this up. But a lot of people questioned at the time when the shots were initially fired, the main sniper team or sniper team one that we talked about, uh, basically a guy came off the rifle uh, when it was fired. It could have been a flinch, it could have been he's looking to see where the shots come from. I don't know, the video is not that good. Um, but I think the reason he did that, just getting back to the Google Maps, is that more likely than not, uh, number one, he couldn't see it due to the actual uh, location of that tree where the shooter is coming from and or uh, if you look at the rifles they're using those are jar rifles and so what those are uh, for folks at home who don't know it's a bolt action rifle and uh, specifically jars in this case they can be chambered in a number of different rounds but they're not chambered in uh, rounds that would typically be used for short range engagements if that makes sense which this would have been so it's probably chambered in either like 300 wind mag uh, seven millimeter maybe 338 lapua and if you know anything about uh, ballistics, those rounds are capable of being extremely accurate at distances far beyond the distances here. So my guess is those guys with those scopes as well, which look to be Night Force 25 power scopes, um, which again, a 25 power scope uh, with Night Force glass in it, you can see things really well at distance. Um, but basically, I think those guys were oriented further uh, than that building, that sniper team one, because they had that obstructed view anyway. And they were probably looking at the buildings beyond that because there's several buildings, four to 500 meters out. And they were probably looking there. I don't know where counter scene counter sniper team two was looking, uh, but they were looking in the same direction as well. But my guess is when the shots actually cracked off that counter sniper one team, basically you look up and you see the guy on the ground reposition as well. What I think they were probably doing was bringing their rifles down because it was a much closer target than the area they were scanning. Sniper team two appeared to be on the same elevation. So they were probably looking in that area, scanning that general area as well um, when the shots actually went off. And sniper team three that we know about, I'm not sure what they were doing. We don't really have a lot of information on them at this point. All we know is their location, which it should be rolling in here, approximately 330 yards away uh, from where the actual shooter was. And uh, there have been media reports that there was an SR-25, which is a uh, AR-10, chambered in 308 typically um, that was actually used for the shots that killed the shooter um, based on the image that was has been leaked or released uh, it definitely seems that that is possible that is what actually happened uh, especially when you consider I'm not going to roll in on YouTube or anywhere the uh, pictures of the actual shooter's face but if you look at the damage to it um, uh, ballistics are crazy and anything can happen, so I don't want to make a definitive judgment on this, uh, but having seen folks get shot with different calibers, um, that looks more like it what I would associate with a 308 uh, type of rifle than something like a 300 Win Mag or a 338 Lapua. Uh, those are very, very powerful rounds and those impacting someone's head um, at you know, 130 yards ish, which is about the distances that those uh, two counter sniper teams were at, uh, probably would have done more damage. It makes more sense to me that that SR-25 that has been reported by several media organizations was most likely set up at the counter sniper three location. And that's probably where the shot was broken from. And before we continue on with the analysis, I do need to thank the main channel sponsor here, and that is Brown Owls. For folks that don't know, Brown Owls is a great place to get any of the things that you're interested in. If you're watching this video, firearms, ammunition, uh, magazines, accessories, scopes, um, all those things are over there at Brown Owls, as well as all your gunsmithing supplies. So big thank you to them. Now let's get back to the video. With all of that portion out of the way, let's talk about some other things here that are certainly important. Uh, number one is going to be, how did the shooter get to that position? Well, uh, from what I understand, uh, different reports have come out that are talking about different layers of security. And this makes perfect sense to me. Uh, number one, President Trump has requested multiple times for additional security uh, to the Secret Service. It has been denied. There's multiple news outlets that have reported that over the last month. That's not anything new. So what definitely could have happened is that there simply just wasn't a lot of Secret Service agents assigned to this detail. Now, typically, when you're talking about any type of uh, PSD or personal security detail, you have different layers to it, right? And it's all about how close they are to them. Um, so you have your inner layer, your 
closest layer, which is going to be like the Secret Service agents in the suits and sunglasses that are right next to the president that everyone's familiar with, the ones that jumped on the president afterwards, excluding the females who ducked for cover. Um, but that is like your inner security team. Then you have like, I guess we'll call it medium security. It depends on the organization you're in, what they actually call it. But that's going to be like typically people in the crowd, things like that. Uh, anything within like submachine gun range type distances. So anything 10 to 100 yards out. That's typically your, your medium security uh, in terms of distances. And then you have your far security, which is everything further out. And from what I understand, the location where that building was, uh, the manufacturing building where the shooter was actually on was not part of the Secret Service area of responsibility. That is what they're claiming anyway at this point. I've seen those reports. I can't verify it. Um, and that was actually uh, to be secured by Homeland Security agents as well as local police departments. Now, saying all of that, uh, having seen the type of work the Secret Service does before, I was at a I was a member of a military unit uh, where President Obama uh, visited, so I saw them operate up close and personal. This was shoot, this was a long time ago. It was over ten years ago now at this point. But basically, the way it worked was it was a planned visit, just like this one. And uh, obviously, President Obama was the president at the time, so probably has a larger security footprint than President Trump does as a candidate. But still, uh, what, what they did essentially was they came out probably two weeks ahead of time and did a scan of the location, just security scan, kind of looked at everything, looked at the buildings, where people needed to be, where to pre-position people. Uh, they got a list of everyone who was going to be attending, ran background checks. And then uh, they came out two days before, if I remember correctly, to... It was either two days before or the day before and established their positions uh, on site where President Obama was going to be coming and they didn't leave. Like, I mean, obviously they took shifts and stuff like that, but there were Secret Service agents at that point where President Obama was going to come out and talk to the troops. Um, so my point in saying that is those guys were there for two days, uh, manned all their security positions and rotated in and out, including when the president was there as well. So in this particular case, I would assume that those buildings were at least initially cleared by the Secret Service agents, or at least if they weren't, they should have been. Now, uh, how could the shooter have gotten there with a rifle? Uh, the images I've seen online show that the rifle was in a case at one point in time. Um, so he could have, you know, used that as a concealment, if you will, of the rifle to walk into there. But from what I understand from multiple media reports at the time, that area wasn't part of the Butler uh, farm area, whatever it was called. So the Secret Service agents weren't actually checking people for firearms at that location, which is kind of insane if you think about it, because this is distances of a hundred yards or in that these people were able to get to with firearms. That's the reports I've heard. I'm not sure if that is true. Given what happened, it seems to indicate that it probably was true. Now, did this War Secret Service agents there, um, you know, well ahead of time? It's certainly possible. It's certainly possible that this kid hid in one of those buildings. I mean, it's an in industrial building. It's entirely possible. Again, he's a relatively local person. He could have been there for a day or more and then came out. That would make sense as to how you could easily, or more easily, I guess you could say, get a rifle uh, into the area. Again, there's a lot of things we don't know at this point, but I'm just trying to war game how this could have happened without conspiracy theories, which I'm totally open to conspiracy theories at this point, but I'm just trying to discuss this from a practical standpoint first. All those other theories, you know, we'll probably dive into a little bit at the end. But with that said, one thing that we know from the BBC footage that we just rolled in, as well as several other, other overhead images, is that there was a ladder there. Uh, and I do believe, based on uh, a report that came out yesterday, that, that either the ladder was there permanently, which it obviously never should have been, the Secret Service should have removed that, or uh, the kid himself put the ladder there and scaled it. Now, why do I say that? Because um, initially when I saw the ladder, I was like, eh, who knows, maybe that was there when the guys, the Secret Service agents, or the Homeland Security agents in this case, scaled it to go up there and confirmed the body was dead. However, a report came out yesterday as of when I'm recording this that a police officer climbed that ladder, a local police officer climbed that ladder, uh, saw the shooter and the shooter oriented his rifle at the police officer and the police officer withdrew. I, I guess he's like a Uvalde cop or something. Um, but that's that was reported that that happened. So if that was the case, then that indicates the ladder was there uh, before the shooting, meaning the kid probably put the ladder up, climbed it. And then as you guys can see from the footage that we may or may not be rolling in, he actually was you know, low crawling up that roof at that point. So how did he get there with a rifle? That's my best guess at this point. However, it could have been utter uh, incompetence as well of the outside perimeter security. We just don't know at this point. Another point I want to bring up about that police officer going up to the actual roof itself and uh, the sequence of events that happened. If you look again, we know that 
both counter sniper teams, at least two of them anyway, were oriented on that building at at the time the shooter was climbing up there, right? Um, that's been well established by multiple timestamp videos. So when the cop got up there, my question is, were the snipers thinking, are those our guys? So maybe they saw a police officer climbing the ladder and then another person with a rifle confused. Is that our guys? Is that not our guys? Uh, maybe they didn't have radio comms with the um, local police force, which is entirely possible, uh, you know, haven't been in the military. Uh, there was a time when I was deployed to Iraq where we couldn't talk to the Marine artillery that was supporting us. Uh, so we literally had to call them on cell phones and it's not because they didn't have good radios. They had great radios. I'm sure we had great radios. Uh, they were encrypted, all the fancy stuff. However, they couldn't talk to each other. So we had to actually talk on cell phones. I realize that sounds insane, but that is how things happen with interagency types of stuff. So it's entirely possible that the local law enforcement could not communicate with the sniper teams. That said, again, two sniper teams were oriented in that direction. So I think someone had tipped them off that something was going on in that direction. Um, but I don't know if the presence of the police officer may have caused uh, the counter sniper guys to hesitate and question what was happening. Uh, I can't say on that, but it is a possibility at this point. Next, we'll talk about the rifle that was actually used. Uh, multiple news outlets have identified it as an AR-15 style rifle that was purchased by the shooter's father about six months beforehand. Uh, that absolutely seems to line up with the images that we've seen. However, the images that we've seen are not good. They're, they're very grainy. And I've seen news outlets report that uh, it had an EOTech optic on it. I've also seen news reports that it had iron sights. So if that is the case, it's entirely possible that uh, that is why he missed the shots here on this particular day. So talking about the actual shot itself, roughly 130 meters um, on a man-sized target, even with iron sights or a red dot, somebody who is even mildly competent could make that shot. Now, uh, again, local weather reports were reporting that there was a five mile an hour north wind at that point and uh, the shot if it hit president trump's ear at the angle it was going essentially coming just like this uh, that alone could have been why that one shot missed um, that five mile an hour wind might have been enough to move it uh, just enough so that way it didn't kill president trump again i know we have a lot of new folks probably watching this video so just kind of go over ballistics a little bit with 556 five, an ar-15 uh, most of your rack grade ar-15s assuming it was a decent model are going to shoot anywhere from two to three inch groups, depending on the ammo. Uh, if the shooter does their part well, some of them can shoot as as tight as one inch groups at the distances that we're talking about here. Uh, so the rifle is capable of very, very good accuracy. And with 5.56, again, it hit him in the ear. If that was two millimeters or a quarter inch to the right, or if his head was turned at a different, different angle, it very easily could have hit his skull. And uh, 556 sometimes does a little bit of weird things with the skull. I've seen uh, reports of folks getting hit with 556, hitting their skull and skipping off depending on the deflection angle. Um, however, the majority of the time that a 556 bullet, when it's going at the speeds it's going at that distance, which is anywhere from 2,700 feet per second, again, up to 3,000 feet per second, uh, is going to crack your skull, make it explode, turn into little fragments and essentially you're dead at that point because your brain is going to take all of those fragments never mind taking the actual projectile itself so um, again the accuracy that was capable there uh, it's entirely possible that the wind moved it just that little bit in that distance to save his life um, but very very close call he was within uh, millimeters of, of being dead right now so very very close call with all of that said, that's kind of my assessment as to what led up to and happened during the shooting. Now, a few things to talk about in terms of like an after action review, judging who did well, who did poorly. Uh, the counter assault team from everything I have seen did very well. Uh, they were on scene very, very quickly from concealment came out, established the 360 perimeter around the president very well. The inner uh, security detail, the men in particular who covered up President Trump seemed to do pretty well. A lot of people have criticized them because Trump was able to afterwards elevate his head and, you know, do the fist pounding that we all saw there. However, anybody who's ever worked a per personal security detail will tell you that there's always a balance between security and whoever you're, you know, guarding. Uh, that person, in theory, has more power than you do in the equation. So sometimes you let them do what they want to do, even though no, it's not the most secure thing, if that makes sense. So that's very likely why they allowed him to do that. I, I, I don't want to criticize him for that. Um, not a big deal, in my opinion, especially if they knew that the shooter was already down. And there's several videos out there that show basically as soon as the CAT team arrived on scene, they were saying, shooter down, shooter down, shooter down. So uh, it's entirely possible that they believe the threat was essentially over at that point, or at least 
highly minimized at that point. So I think the CAT team did well. They responded quickly. Again, established 360 perimeter. And that's not always easy to do during a situation where everyone wants to look in one direction, whether it be where the shooter was com coming from or, you know, it doesn't really matter. You still have to make sure there's not additional shooters in the crowd behind him, all of the other things that go into just establishing a base security plan. They did it pretty darn well. I have no issue uh, with what they did there. A few other things to talk about here um, is basically where do I think the failure happened? Well, assuming it's not some type of conspiracy theory, which again, I am totally open to, uh, but I'm just trying to present the facts as we know them. Uh, I think the people who are at fault here for this is whoever came up with the plan for the security for this. So uh, some senior agent, I would imagine that the Secret Service uh, decided to uh, put the counter sniper teams where they were. Now, from what I understand, just doing some research on this, uh, the counter sniper teams for the Secret Service work in pairs, and that's that's their SOP or their standard operating procedures. However, if they were undermanned due to staffing shortages, which very likely was the case, and only had so many, so let's say, for example, they had six. Just hypothetically, we know there was three teams at this point, so let's say they had six. Uh, do they have the capability or the ability as agents on the ground to recognize a threat pattern and then deviate from those SOPs or those standard operating procedures. So what I mean by that is if you have a limited amount of snipers and you're always working in two two man teams, uh, do you have the ability to do, we used to call it split team operations, um, where essentially you could just break that team apart because the actual reality on the ground necessitated that or the reality on the ground said that that was the, the better choice amongst all the bad choices, right? Because whenever you're doing this type of security, every choice is bad. Ideally, you just have President Trump inside of a locked uh, and armored vehicle and you wouldn't have to worry about that, but that's not how these work. So everything's a compromise. Now, if they had the ability to deviate from their SOPs of two-man teams and they didn't do it, the most obvious one in this particular case is that water tower. From everything we've seen, uh, there was no a counter sniper team in that water tower. And if they had done that or even had one sniper in there, very likely this scenario would have never played out the way it did. It's the most obvious point uh, to establish a counter sniper team. Uh, for some reason, that did not happen. My guess is some senior agent just either made up or, or messed up, excuse me, or who knows what, was just completely incompetent and didn't understand that when looking at the actual area itself. Uh, so my guess is uh, the counter sniper teams probably didn't have much of a say in where they were actually told to set up. Now where they set up was fine outside of that water tower. There really should have been someone on that water tower. And uh, I don't know if they were told they couldn't do that or what. Uh, but whoever made that decision to not put someone there definitely bears a lot of responsibility without Question. Another thing that was a glaring gap that we saw when watching this was once the president was shot at, the actual team that got around him uh, was composed of so, uh, at least two that I saw, uh, small statured females. And this isn't a dig on females or anything like that, but you have to realize President Trump, I think is like 6'3". He's not a small individual. So trying to uh, assign someone whose job is literally to put their body between bullets and the president um, who is 5'6", and the most vulnerable portion of your body is up here uh, in terms of threats from bullets, is a uh, personnel, uh, a poor personnel choice, let's just say, in terms of assigning people to the president. I don't know if it had to do with they want women on the president's detail, but if you are a personal security detail and you're trying to guard someone who is 6'3", everyone on that inner security team should be at least 6'3". I mean, that just kind of makes sense, right? So whoever decided to do that, probably not the best decision there. And uh, one thing that's unfortunate about this whole situation that we've learned so far is that the FBI are the ones that are actually going to be investigating this. Uh, I'm sure they have access to everything the shooter's ever done online, their phone records, everything like that. And the FBI is also an organization that most people in America don't trust at this point, uh, especially when it comes to President Trump. Uh, members of that organization have been caught trying to frame President Trump for certain things in the past. That's not my opinion. That's, that's an objective fact. Um, so a lot of people don't have faith that the investigation is going to go all that well. And then additionally, um, a lot of people are of the belief that there's just no way that a 20 year old uh, with an AR-15 could get into that position without help from the inside on some level. Again, that's entirely possible. I'm not saying it's not true. What is also possible is 
uh, the incompetence of members of our government is very high. And I think a lot of Americans just don't realize that. Um, the Secret Service, again, probably didn't have a large detail. They were probably uh, relying on local police as well as Homeland Security agents, from what I understand, to do the outer portions of the security, i.e. secure those buildings. And it's entirely possible that, again, as we talked about, a police officer went up there. He, he could have been a horrible police officer, and that could have led to this happening, right? Uh, if he, as has been reported anyway, again, we don't really know at this point, but if he, you know, withdrew after a rifle was pointed at him at an event that he knew the guy with the rifle was going to shoot the president, well, then that police officer absolutely failed at his job. Um, and additionally, there could have been other people assigned to guard the, that dead space of those buildings. Again, dead space is the areas that the counter snipers can't cover and they don't have visual confirmation on it. And they could have just not done it. Again, we see the video of people calling for officers, pointing to officers, uh, saying there's a guy on the roof with a rifle and nothing seems to happen at all in any sort of uh, short time period, that much we can say for sure. So unfortunately that is where we're at, but I think hopefully at this point, if you guys have watched this, you have a good idea of what actually happened on the ground, the angles that were involved, because I think that's important, the distances that were involved and uh, kind of how it played out. So from here, we're just gonna have to see what happens and new information is coming out every day as I imagine it will continue to do over the next week. So if you guys are interested in any uh, new information, definitely follow me on social media right now. Twitter and Truth are the best places to do that. Uh, I've been posting everything I see over there so that way you guys can reference it and make your own decisions. Uh, if you like this type of video, maybe we'll do more in the future, these types of breakdowns. And if you're interested in that, definitely hit the subscribe button. If you've subscribed, you've hit the notification bell, and you're not seeing two to four videos a week here on the channel, then you're being censored by an algorithm. Uh, you can get around that by following, uh, rather signing up for the email at the website here on your screen. This email goes out once a month and it has all of the videos since the previous month's email went out. And uh, if there's deals on any of the cool stuff, like if you guys saw the uh, the cat team, the rifle, all the cool stuff, the Knights Armament stuff, the optics, the ammo, they had, one guy had a side folding stock adapter on there. Any of that cool gear that we typically talk about here on the channel, uh, if there's deals on it, it will go out in my daily deals email. That email goes out every day as the name indicates and it has eight of the best deals that we find around the internet. And if the item is in that email on that particular day, it's the best deal I know of anywhere on the internet. So that way it saves you guys some time and hopefully saves you some money as well. And uh, there's a good meme in there as well that people like. So there is that. I look forward to hearing your comments down below. I definitely think there's going to be some interesting stuff coming in over the next couple of days. And definitely share this video if you found it interesting. Because I think uh, there's going to be a lot of people that found this, this breakdown interesting. We shall see anyway. That's it guys. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you in the next video.